It's the title holder of the largest flying aircraft in the world. Over one million pounds of gravity-defying heavy metal. A jet so huge that the Wright brothers' first flight could have taken place in the cargo bay. The six engines on this giant produce over 300,000 pounds of thrust, making it the world's most powerful aircraft. It's the one-of-a-kind Antonov 225. gigantic jet with dimensions that defy belief. Fully loaded and fueled, this beast weighs more than a million and a quarter pounds. It seems to defy gravity as well as it lifts that massive bulk into the skies. A jet so big, even the man in charge of flying it doubted it could get off the ground. The first time I saw the aircraft in the assembly hangar, I said, it is not possible. <laughs> it is not possible that this aircraft can be airborne. <laughs> its wingspan reaches 290 feet. The diameter of the fuselage, 63 feet. It stands nearly seven stories high. This aircraft is so immense, one tractor can't pull it alone. Two heavy-duty tractors are required to tow it from the hangar to the airfield. These numbers add up to one simple distinction. Antonov 225 is the largest jetliner in the world. This six-engine beast is the heavyweight champion of the skies. Imagine a jet so gargantuan that it would barely squeeze between the goalposts on a football field. To put it in everyday perspective, the Antonov 225 dwarfs the most prolific jetliner in the world, the Boeing 737. And at 276 feet long, the 225 is 45 feet longer than the largest passenger jet, the Boeing 747-400. When it comes to lifting heavyweight cargo, only a few aircraft in the world can handle the loads. The Air Force's C-17 Globemaster hauls 85 tons. And the mighty C-5A Galaxy lumbers through the sky with up to 135 tons. But when it comes to megalodes, Antonov aircraft from Ukraine are in a class of their own. The Antonov 124, the 225's little brother, as if anything this big can be called little, packs a whopping 150 tons plus of cargo lifting might. The 225 is the next order of magnitude. It has a 250 ton capacity. And the 225 is capable of carrying up to 250 tons externally on 
the roof. Not only is the 225 the heavy lifting champ, the aircraft is immense. Its belly is so cavernous that eight average sized houses could be stacked inside. A jet so enormous, those who've stood in its massive shadow have dubbed it the aluminum overcast. But being the world's largest isn't the only thing that sets this Soviet-built jet apart. The Antonov 225 is rare. In fact, you're looking at the only one in existence today. The 225 has a story. A tale of creation desolation, and then a phoenix-like rebirth from the economic ashes of the former Soviet Union. The saga surrounding this one-of-a-kind jet truly sets it apart from all other flying machines. The Antonov 225 evolved out of the intense competition with the United States in the race for space. This heavy metal monster was built in the Ukraine in 1988 to carry the Soviet space shuttle. The 119-foot-long shuttle nestled comfortably on the broad shoulders of the Antonov 225 and was dwarfed by the craft designed to transport it. Unfortunately for the 225, size isn't everything. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, and by 1991, the Soviet Union itself would be history. And not even size could save the Antonov 225 from the economic woes of a country in transition. Their space program was canceled, and this awe-inspiring jet was decommissioned and demoted to the biggest junk pile in the world. They parked the airplane in, in a corner of the, the test facility at Gostomel, and they were watching this wonderful asset falling into disrepair. It would be nearly a decade before the mighty Antonov 225 would defy the odds and gravity once again. The most massive aircraft carries the name of its creator. The name of a man whose passion for flight began in the days when Tsar Nicholas II ruled Russia, and aviation science was in its infancy. He would eventually become a hero in a nation that didn't yet exist. Oleg Konstantinovich Antonov was born on February 7, 1906, near Moscow, just three years after the Wright brothers made their famous flight at Kitty Hawk. As his country weathered World War I and then the Russian Revolution, young Antonov kept his head in the clouds. He collected World War I airplane parts, and this fascination with flight led him to design his first glider. Oleg Antonov built his first flying machine uh, in 1923, in age 17, it was glider. Uh, it was not very successful glider, but during the next uh, 15 years, uh, Oleg Antonov built a lot of gliders which were on the world scale and keep some Soviet and world records. He honed his engineering skills at the Leningrad Polytechnic Institute and graduated in 1930. He then worked as chief of design at various Soviet factories, developing more than 30 types of gliders. He was very talented engineer and especially in, in aerodynamics. Uh, during the Second World War, Oleg Antonov, he was deputy chief designer for Mr. Yakovlev, a famous uh, fighter designer. Uh, but uh, 
it, it was not enough for him. On his free time, if he had free time, he designed his own uh, construction. And one of uh, that was famous in future Antonov II by plane. This little plane, the Antonov II, displayed outside his Kiev office, is the one that eventually led him towards the heavy-duty cargo jets that bear his name today. The project was uh, supported by Mr. Yakovlev and by Ministry of Aviation Industry, and the first prototype was built in Kiev factory and uh, flew in 1946. Aircraft was good, successful, and the uh, government designed to to start big-scale production. Antonov established his own design bureau in Kiev. The objective was to construct a plane that could withstand the rigors of flight all over the vast Soviet Union, something that could dust crops in the Ukraine, as well as deliver mail to the frozen wastes of Siberia. 18,000 of these workhorses were built, and many still do their jobs today. Antonov's ability to design aircraft that perfectly fulfilled Soviet needs led to a friendship with Nikita Khrushchev and some status in the USSR. Not just anybody gets an office like this in the Soviet Union. Antonov's office is preserved like a shrine and is packed with vintage Cold War era trappings, secret recorders, complex communication systems, and hidden panels revealing low-tech tricks of the engineering trade all speak volumes about Oleg Antonov and his vital role in Soviet aviation. From this office, Antonov continued to design planes, and those planes kept getting bigger. Thanks to this man, the Ukraine holds the little-known distinction of consistently producing the biggest planes in the world. The world's first wide-bodied aircraft was developed here in 1965, the Antonov-22. To this day, the AN-22 remains the largest turboprop in the world. Approximately 100 of these massive military transport planes were produced. Then came the ironically named little brother to the biggest jet in the world. The Antonov-124. The 124 owes its whale-like form to its function. It was developed in the mid-70s as a strategic airlifter for the Soviet military to transport missiles and tanks. With its 240-foot wingspan and 227-foot length, it easily captures the record for the largest production aircraft in the world. Over 60 of these jets have been built. Oleg Antonov led the initial design work, and within the government, there were some conflicts of opinion on design. But Antonov prevailed. Notable features of his giant creation were thicker wings than its predecessors, providing more lift and fuel capacity. The aircraft had nose and tail cargo doors, allowing vehicles to drive in one side and out the other. The jet had the ability to kneel down on its undercarriage, making for easier front loading, and had its own internal crane to pick up cargo at the rear, carry it straight into the aircraft and position where desired. The 124 excelled at going where jets usually don't go, using its gigantic bank of landing gear to nimbly touch down anywhere it's needed, even on unpaved runways. The Antonov 124 is capable of landing successfully on primitive runways. It has even landed in the polar region on frozen airstrips when we used to transport supplies to that region. The first prototype flew in December 1982, and by 1984, 
the airliner was in production. The same year, her creator, Oleg Antonov, died at the age of 78. The desk calendar in his office still marks the time period. This pioneering aviator's presence still lingers in his untouched office, and it lingers in his massive aircraft as well. Because with the success of the AN-124, Antonov had planted the seeds for an even bigger jet, a jet that would shoulder the burden of the Soviet space program and their race with the United States to dominate space. One thing is certain. In the former Soviet Union, bigger was always better. From colossal statues to humongous helicopters, largeness reigned supreme. The Cold War competition with the West was fierce, and Antonov's designers strived to outdo the Americans. I remember that all time we compete with the United States in transport aircraft. The United States built Hercules, they built Antonov 12, they built Antonov 22, United States built C5, they built Antonov 1 to 4, and after that we built just Antonov 2 to 5. And I don't know, maybe American, United States don't need bigger plane, and they, they do not build anything more bigger than Antonov 2 to 5. <laughs> Nowhere was the competition more intense than the race for space. The Soviets were developing their own space shuttle called Buran, which means snowstorm in English. Its design looks similar to America's space shuttle. Soviet engineers had attempted to design something different. But in the end, a straight aerodynamic copy was selected. There are, however, significant differences. Buran has no main engines, so it has more payload capacity and it relies entirely on external rocket boosters to achieve orbit, allowing it four times greater lifting power for cargo. Unlike America's shuttle with main engines and external tank and solid boosters, Buran uses liquid fuel boosters that are throttle controlled and turned on and off to avoid blow-up disasters like the 1986 Challenger tragedy. By the mid-80s, the Soviet shuttle program had fallen behind schedule and they were desperate to keep up with America's program. The Soviets lacked a vehicle large enough to transport Buran. So in 1985, design began on the Antonov 225. It was necessary to create and design a system and vehicle to carry the space shuttle from the manufacturing plants of the Soviet Union, which are located a long distance from the launch pad. The Soviets wanted this big boy built fast and on a tight budget. We had very, very strict requirements to construct this aircraft as quickly as we could and with as little expense. It was all due to the fact that the United States already had their space shuttle and the USSR leg behind. The pressure was on for the Antonov Design Bureau. So they decided to modernize the Antonov 124, to upgrade it, and use the 124's existing assemblies and parts to create a bigger, more effective jet for the purpose of moving the shuttle. Nicknamed Maria, the Russian word for dream, the Antonov 225 grew from the technology that built its little brother. Looking at the 225, you can see that it has many similarities to the Antonov 124. There is a commonality between the two aircraft. The cross-section is identical to the Antonov 124. The wing panels of the 225 are actually identical to the 124. And the engines are the same as Antonov 124. There are six, though instead of four. That's where the comparisons break down. It doesn't take an aviation expert to spot the differences between the two craft. Most of them have to do with size and power. 
There was a change of the tail unit. It's a twin fin tail to compensate for carrying Buran on top of the aircraft. There is no aft cargo door because of the length of the fuselage and we increased the number of rear landing gear struts. We have seven on each side for the Antonov 225 with a total of 32 tires including front landing gear. Designers at Antonov in Kiev were only given three and a half years to design this gigantic new jet and get it off the ground. Initially, the task seemed insurmountable. Engineers couldn't even find a place big enough to build the jet. It was a problem to find a location to construct the aircraft, for it would not fit in any existing facility. At first, we had to build the fuselage in parts and store the parts at angles to fit them inside the shop. Thanks to Soviet bureaucracy, at one point, the Antonov 225's designers had more jet than hangar. <laughs> in the USSR at the time, it was more complicated to construct a new building than a new jet. We used to construct aircraft in those days quicker than buildings. And we had to build the 225 so rapidly it grew faster than the building we were making it in. There were design difficulties as well. The 225 was designed to transport gigantic goods, and the jet needed to be able to land wherever those outsized objects needed to be. We encountered great problems with landing gear. We faced the problem of creating the aircraft with a takeoff weight of 600 tons that would also be capable of landing on unprepared airfields. The landing gear had to be made so that it would not break the runway. The solution to the problem? a massive bank of landing gear on the Antonov 225 that puts 18 wheelers to shame. 32 tires burn rubber every time this 600-ton behemoth touches down. There were other challenges as well. The head designer recalls one whoops moment when the jet was nearly complete. When the aircraft was constructed, it turned out that it wasn't possible to install the Buran on top of it. We had no cargo handling equipment back then, and the crane on the field was not able to install it. So engineers quickly designed a special crane to lift the Buran 60 feet onto the 225's back. The 225's designers overcame the massive difficulties associated with their massive aircraft and met their deadline. With pomp and circumstance, the aircraft was rolled out of the hangar. Now it was time to prove the six-engine giant could fly. The Antonov Design Bureau labored hard to meet the strict Soviet government deadline for the 225. It was a tradition in those days to finish the tasks by the end of the year. The aircraft flew first on December 1st, 1988. The director of flight testing, who initially thought flying the Antonov 225 would be impossible, suddenly experienced a change of heart as he took part in this craft's historic first flight. We started to test the aircraft on taxiway. Next, trial runs on the runway, and finally the first maiden flight. And when it took to the air, I saw that flying the 225 was absolutely possible, and it was incredible. Everyone who worked on the jet felt a deep connection to it, from designers to test pilots. I felt very, very proud when I first saw it take off. It was a joyous time. My name is Alexander Galunenko. I'm the leading test pilot of the Antonov 225 aircraft. Of course I enjoy this job. It is like no other, a real challenge. This aircraft is absolutely one of a kind. 
The 225 broke 109 world records for range, altitude, and cargo capabilities within months of its maiden flight. In 1989, the aircraft accomplished the mission it was designed for. It flew with a 90-ton Soviet space shuttle, the Buran, attached to it externally for the very first time. It is very, very hard to express how I felt. Proud. I felt joy. I was in some euphoric state. I was overcome with joy when it flew with the orbiter. Everyone was. The 225, with Buran attached, made its debut to a worldwide audience at the 1989 Paris Air Show. The gargantuan jet stole the show. Well, I remember Paris in 1989, when all the other aircraft at the show had almost no visitors. But there was a long line of people standing around our craft wanting to visit it. The Antonov 225's bulk and strength quickly captured the imagination of the world. There were even proposals to turn the Antonov into a flying cruise ship. There were a lot of bizarre proposals on the part of very wealthy and rich people abroad. It was suggested to make it a flying hotel with rooms and suites on the upper deck. And on the lower deck, there were swimming pools and casinos. <laughs> and how many people could lounge aboard this recreational fantasy? It is technically feasible that the jet could carry 1,500 people. Here's some perspective for you. The largest capacity passenger jet in flight today, the Boeing 747-400, carries a mere 524 passengers when fully loaded. With modifications, the Antonov 225 could carry almost three times as many people. Buran ended up making only one space flight and the 225 had only been airborne for a few short years when an event took place that changed the world and grounded all grandiose dreams about the future of this giant jet. In 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, and the Soviet Union's space program, which included this aircraft, lost its financing. Boris Yeltsin canceled the space program due to lack of funds and for another reason. Turns out the project manager was one of the planners of the attempted 1991 coup. The king of the skies became a hulking derelict, its parts cannibalized for other jets. The only Antonov 225 in the world was being slowly parted out, sacrificed bit by bit to help save the company that developed it from economic ruin. It was grounded because of lack of funds, and it stayed idle for eight years. The jet that had been created for Cold War competition would eventually be reborn as a capitalist tool. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the Antonov Design Bureau was forced into the survival mode. In order to stay in business without government money, they turned to their fleet of giant airliners. We began marketing the main aircraft in our fleet, the Antonov 124, which allows us to carry outsized and heavy cargo. Creating Antonov Airlines, 
they formed a partnership with the London-based company Airfoil Heavy Lift that handles the booking of orders, scheduling, and flight routing. Okay. Okay, Together, they fill a niche using Antonov's ultra-jumbo jets that no one else can. Their major Western competitors use 747s, but they aren't large enough to handle bulky outsized cargo. Before long, Antonov was transporting everything from power station generators to auto racing crews, cars, gear and all, to points all over the world. Oh, it's pretty well a case of you, you name it, we've carried it. Uh, personally, uh, my favourite is uh, the railway locomotive that we took complete from Canada to Ireland a few years ago. Um, that set a, a world record for the largest commercial payload. It was 109 tonnes. The sort of psychological concept of putting a railway engine in the aeroplane is, is well, mind-blowing. Okay, so, so you're going to talk about, say, 100, 100 to 110 tonnes and drop half in Chicago and the, the, the other half in Columbus. So you, so you, you okay. want to do... Well, this is the operations centre of Airfoil Heavy Lift, and it's where we coordinate the flights uh, that we operate with the Antonov uh, Design Bureau, and that includes the AN-124 and the AN-225 aircraft. Planning is crucial when cargo is oversized and or overweight. Computers help determine how cargo will be loaded, and plotting the route is challenging. Hefty cargo guzzles up a lot of gas, and several refueling stops are usually required. Remarkably, the biggest airplanes in the world don't need the biggest runways in the world. These jets can touch down in limited spaces. The 124 can even land on grass fields, making the aircraft popular in Africa. It airlifts life-saving supplies to countries in need. It once packed 452 Ethiopian refugees into its bulk and flew them to safety. The mighty 124 also carries the Antonov Design Bureau. Its utility kept the company in business after the Iron Curtain fell. Because we earn money by our Antonov 124 and we support Design Bureau designers in Kyiv to survive in, in difficult time. Their survival turned into a robust business. By the late 90s, the company was receiving requests to carry loads weighing more than 150 tons. The maximum carrying capacity of the Antonov 124. We gained enormous experience in the commercial service and operation of the 124 and we came to the conclusion that there is a range of even bigger cargoes than the 124 can hold. Opportunity was calling for the 225 and its massive capacity, but it was rusting in a nearby field. Company leaders realized it could fill the demand of lifting megaloads. All of this heavy cargo can be easily carried by the Antonov 225 and management of yeah. our company chose to refurbish this aircraft yeah. after years of being grounded. The Antonov Design Bureau decided to return the airliner to the skies. And they set an ambitious goal. The mighty Antonov 225 would make its second debut at the Paris Air Show. But after sitting idle for eight years, the 225 would need extensive restoration before it could fly again. <laughs> Suddenly, it was deja vu all over again as the original builders, designers and pilots of this massive craft were called upon to get it ready for its resurrection.
Now we are facing the problem of certifying the aircraft. We plan to certify it for civil purposes, which means we have to replace some military systems with civilian ones for safety reasons. The decade-old jet had to be treated like it was brand new. The 225 had never been certified. It had never been proven safe to fly. Earlier flights, even the one with a Soviet shuttle on its back, were all military test flights. Now, this giant needed even more trials to prove it met international aviation standards before it would receive certification for commercial flight. The main part of the certification was done in 1989, but after the Soviet Union collapsed, the process was stopped. So there are about 8 to 10 flights left to finish certification, and we are going to do those flights and get the certification for this aircraft. The jet needed to be brought up to date as well. Engineers installed modern navigation and telemetry equipment and a new Honeywell communication system. The aircraft flies with a crew of 17 and their cabins received upgrades. New stricter noise regulations had to be met. And believe it or not, this beefy aircraft had to be, well, beefed up. We had to reinforce the primary structure, especially the floor and nose section of the fuselage, so that the aircraft could be able to transport the large and heavy cargoes weighing up to 250 tons. Every one of these improvements would prep this big jet for the long haul. There is special ground maintenance work now in progress before our first flight after its long stay on the ground. The 225 received six new Ukrainian-built engines that together produce over 300,000 pounds of thrust. For maximum lift, the jet must carry 280 tons, or 76,000 gallons of fuel, an amount that would gas up over 6,000 average-sized cars. The 225 needs a lake of fuel. It gobbles it at the staggering rate of 18 tons an hour, and depending on the weight of the load, it has a potential range of over 8,000 miles. That's the distance between New York and Hong Kong. Before any pilot makes this big bird stretch its 290-foot wingspan, he must prepare for some of the idiosyncrasies of flying such a beast. Of course there are some difficulties, moments a pilot must be prepared for. For example, the big wingspan means there are moments that the aircraft resists acceleration. The wings are so enormous, they effectively must lift themselves first and then the aircraft. Consequently, any change in flight speed can be tricky for the crew. And the high-rise cockpit means the pilot is perched three stories up in the air during landings, which means what he sees isn't necessarily what he gets. There are difficulties with landing big aircraft, like the 124 or Boeing 747. The same thing happens here on the 225. For example, the eyes of the pilot are about 10 meters off the ground when landing so he has to rely on instruments to land instead of what he sees. Maximum takeoff weight for this muscular jet is a staggering 1,280,000 pounds. That's the equivalent weight of eight 737s lifting off. Would a pilot need brawn of his own to bully that 640 tons of aluminum, fuel and cargo into the skies? 
No, it's quite curious. Everyone who sees the aircraft for the first time has asked me that question. It seems there should be a big man, a big pilot, to operate this big aircraft. But actually any pilot, large or small, who receives training could operate the 225. It doesn't require a big pilot. Though a wide palm or an extra helping hand is required to throttle up all six engines at once. Within a year of rescuing the 225 from mothballs, and after replacing cannibalized parts and updating systems, the men who originally built the jet have their pride on the line. Now it was time for the 225 to prove itself airworthy again with a test flight. Twenty million dollars was spent upgrading the Antonov 225. And in April 2001, after being grounded for eight years, the six-engine Goliath powers up and lifts off on its second maiden flight. With the world's largest airlifter flying again, the Antonov Design Bureau makes plans to take every advantage of the 225. The aircraft packs a lot of capacity, with cargo lifting muscle of more than a half million pounds. And its 140-foot-long cargo hold could swallow up the entire fuselage of a Boeing 737. Engineers are studying the 225 as a possible way to move 737 airframes to and from various manufacturing plants thousands of miles apart. And the jet is unique in that it can carry cargo on top as it did with the Soviet shuttle. In design now are aerodynamic modules that will ride on top of the aircraft where the shuttle used to. These will carry items too bulky for the 225's immense cargo hold. A month after its maiden flight, the aircraft is certified. It's a proud time for the Ukrainians. In a grand ceremony attended by Ukraine President Kuchma, the aircraft receives its certification for commercial operation. A few weeks later, their hard work pays off and they achieve their goal. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Borgia, Borgia. Borgia, Borgia, Borgia. Borgia, Borgia. Borgia, Borgia. Borgia, Borgia. Borgia, Borgia. Borgia, Borgia. The 225 flies to France and re-debuts at the Paris Air Show. Like before, the mighty jet fascinates all who see it. This time, the 225 represents commerce instead of cosmonauts. No Soviet space shuttle is mounted to the external suspension on the back of the aircraft this time. <laughs> Instead, the Antonov crew busily networks in hopes of eventually hauling other countries' goods in their one-of-a-kind creation. And when the Antonov 225 eventually thunders down the runway and lifts its bulk into the skies, the people of the Paris Air Show aren't just seeing the rebirth of the biggest jet in the world. 
they're seeing a handful of workers from the former Soviet Union take flight into a new economic world. The feelings for me are not that much different from the feelings from its first flight. I feel proud for the Antonov company and glad that in these difficult times we have managed to find the resources to put this aircraft in operation again. This jet's resurrection at the air show is an unqualified success. Thirteen years since its first flight, the 225 returns to its former glory. Transformed from a giant of the Cold War to a commercial giant, this wide body is ready for the rigorous reality of hauling heavy cargo around the globe. 